Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Mold, lead, leaks, and even murder. Those were just some of the conditions and concerns described in emotional testimonies by dozens of public housing residents during a hearing in United States District Court in September. The hearing was on whether an independent monitor should be appointed to oversee the sad state of the buildings run by the New York City Housing Authority, also known as NYCHA. Many of us can remember a time when New York City had some of the best maintained public housing projects in the country. When did this downward spiral begin and why? My guest today is Nicholas Dagan Bloom, a professor of social science at New York Institute of Technology. He's the author of Public Housing That Worked, New York in the 20th Century, and co-editor of Affordable Housing in New York, The People, Places, and Policies That Transformed a City. Welcome. Thank you. I'm it seems you. as if uh, almost every week we are reading an article about the deplorable conditions in the public housing projects in New York City. And there is currently, uh, well, NYCHA, New York City, and the federal governments have entered into a consent degree, not yet approved by the court, uh, that would appoint a federal monitor mm -hmm. uh, to oversee the housing projects. Yes. How would you describe the physical state of uh, the housing projects right now? Oh, that's a complicated a question. We're talking about an enormous system with thousands of buildings with a tremendous range of um, quality at this point. Um, some of the projects uh, have been, for instance, under the Sandy uh, rebuild, have been significantly renovated in certain dimensions, maybe not apartments. Uh, others have not had significant renovation for a very long time. So we're talking about a system with a tremendous range of qualities. Um, some projects like Queensbridge houses uh, were recipients of, for instance, the mayor's roof projects. So they got upgrades there. So it's difficult, I think, to generalize about the system as a whole. What we can say for sure is that these are old buildings. Um, many of them, I mean, the majority of them were built between the 1940s and the 1960s. Uh, most of them were built with a kind of 50-year kind of lifespan in mind. And, um, you know, almost all of them, you know, you can look at an individual project, and if you look at the capital needs of these, they're, you know, without doubt, maybe $200 million per project uh, needed. And we're talking about a lot with uh, apartment repairs. I mean, it can be a whole range of things, elevators, et cetera. So there is an enormous need system-wide, even though there is a fair variation uh, by development. Um, for about six years, the Daily News has been reporting on the problems at the Housing Authority, um, just to go down a litany of, yeah. of them, uh, that NYCHA had failed to spend uh, more than $40 million in federal money that was meant to install security uh, cameras at some of the most crime-ridden projects. Uh, NYCHA had warehouses filled with probably tens of millions of dollars worth of equipment, appliances, machinery that it had lost track of, and I mm -hmm. think it wound up just selling off some of the stuff. Um, th we've heard the revelations about uh, rodents, leaks, falling ceilings, broken elevators, tenants going weeks without heat, months without gas, I mentioned the lead and the mold, uh, tenants waiting uh, years for repairs, uh, NYCHA officials lying about the um, extent of the lead and mold problem. Are we talking about a management problem or a money problem or both? <laughs> uh, it's both. So um, what made public housing work, let's say back in the 20th century, uh, is the combination of a large uh, institution, more along the line of a city agency, very large, well-staffed, relatively well-funded uh, institution, right, that was spending on an annual basis, thanks to the federal government, uh, money for uh, renovation, let's say. Uh, and around the time when I was researching uh, the Public Housing That Worked book, it was already clear uh, that the kind of financial uh, picture of NYCHA was changing dramatically. For instance, NYCHA was already, in, back in the early 2000s, using um, capital funds to help meet its operating budgets which means it wasn't spending the money on the buildings, it was spending to just basically keep its operations uh, basically um, sound. So that means you have more and more deferred 
um, maintenance. And so, that, so that's, on the one hand, there was a lot of deferred maintenance going on for a, quite a long time and insufficient federal capital funds. The other side of it, the other way money was saved by, was by not hiring. Uh, and so we've seen this a number of times, like in the heating outage, which came up, um, insufficient numbers of um, boiler maintainers, right? Um, but we also see um, in the central office, they basically have, have scaled back that significantly. People who basically did the kind of work in compliance and other things like that, which NYCHA was known for. So you have basically both a shrinking um, capital budget on one hand, and also basically a loss of a lot of sort of the human knowledge which kept housing going. The kind of people who'd been there for decades, who I met and were kind of on the way out, were retiring and so forth. And instead of rehiring and so forth, you know, it was this attrition to save money. And, and I think that's where you get. So it's that combination where you really don't have the money you need to, to basically do the, the capital work. And then you also don't really have the money for operations even, so you cut back on people. And you know, I think then you start making kind of mistakes. Um, you've said that the disinvestment yeah. in public housing project started back in the 90s. I guess it was, and maybe you can correct me, at first the Fed started to pull out, and then mm -hmm. the, the city and the state. Mm -hmm. So who's funding? Who's funding the public projects now? Well, no, it's funny. People call it city housing, but it's not. It's still federal. Uh, almost all the money that basically supports NYCHA in its operating budgets and most of its capital budget, aside from what has been promised now by the mayor, uh, has come from the federal government. And that's from basically the 1930s to the present. So um, the, the key funding source, so we should really call it federal housing. Okay. Um, but there were city and state projects which were built and the city and the state had some they, they basically generated these projects locally, and then there was some support for them, but yes, the city and the state stepped back. But prim and primarily, the funding for public housing in New York has come from the federal government. But it hasn't been cut back? Significantly. Okay. Because Congress made, basically the, the real sea change uh, is that uh, the loss of democratic control of Congress. Uh, and so the really, the two couple good years you see in recent memory for NYCHA in terms of funding was when Nancy Pelosi, uh, was in charge, uh, and that's when basically there were fairly robust funds for public housing. Um, but otherwise, right, Congress uh, is essentially, um, as it's currently composed, is essentially uh, against the public housing program uh, openly because uh, in much of the United States, uh, public housing was considered a failure decades ago, and every effort has been made to basically uh, push uh, people out and basically shift programs in other directions. You do mention in, in one of your articles that I read that um, you know, New York is one of maybe the only city left that still has the big support, mm -hmm. still has the big housing projects. I mean, other cities like Chicago, right. I think St. Louis, right. just gave up on them and blew them up, demolished them. Right. Uh, and New York has at least um, continued to Right. to fight to keep them. Um, in terms of the capital needs, I saw one figure that said, if you wanted to really <clears throat> refit the, the, the housing projects in New York, it would cost $32 billion? Yeah, the most recent figure. That's wow. Great. But I mean, it's important to realize that um, that's to bring housing projects back to sort of the glory days. Uh, we've seen, for instance, in there have been these public-private partnerships uh, which are working on some NYCHA projects out in the Rockaways, for instance, and they're doing it, uh, they're doing renovation at a much more cost effective rate. So um, it's entirely possible to imagine uh, NYCHA's housing projects being much more livable and good places without having to spend $32 billion. Um, on the other hand, I think that because New York is the only city that's basically maintained large housing projects, um, this is it, you know, the, if, they, if we want public housing in New York, then the city and the state um, are going to have to pay for it. Uh, and that could be, for instance, obviously they're not going to spend $30 billion in one year. It's just impossible for the capital division to do all that. But, you know, the city is going to have to come up with a plan, maybe $3 billion for 10 years, and basically move forward on some of these large capital needs. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, management. Um, I, the Daily News has written about um, NYCHA board members earning $200,000 a year in salaries, uh, driving expensive cars, living in expensive apartments while the housing projects they're managing are, are falling apart. 
uh, I, uh, about NYCHA's failure to spend federal money that it has yeah. uh, to alleviate some of the physical problems. It had the money, but has not spent it in some, um, according to the reports. Uh, just last week, there was a story in the Daily News about how NYCHA has spent more than $10 million paying outside attorneys mm -hmm. to deal with the federal um, lawsuit when it has, I don't know, 50, 60 lawyers on its uh, staff. It sounds sort of like bad management to me. I don't know. What do you think? I mean, I can't comment <laughs> on internal. I mean, I know there have been some reforms. For instance, the, the sort of full-time NYCHA board members were eliminated years ago who were paid in that respect. I mean, the chair was paid, certainly a salary. Um, but as for the other ones, I, you know, I can't comment. But I will say this. For a very long time, uh, the Housing Authority was noted for you know, decent maintenance of its housing projects, full projects, et cetera. Um, but it wasn't even perfect back then either. And I think that when we get to public institutions um, and they come under this sort of scrutiny, uh, certainly we're going to have a lot of questions. When you start digging in to what a public, a, you know, a public authority like this does, I think there will be questionable um, choices because the public sector is under another level of scrutiny. Yeah. And, and we do expect them to operate at a higher level when, in fact, I mean, essentially it's a public benefit corporation. And I'm sure there are decisions which are made, you know, which, uh, you know, as part of a corporate sort of, you know, direction, which look odd from the outside. So hopefully they won't make those again. And, and just uh, when we talk about the, the magnitude of what's at stake, we're talking yeah. about uh, more than 400,000 residents, right. about 178,000 families Apartments. Uh, in, what, 325 different projects. Yeah. So, so it's, it's, an yeah. Enorm it's a city. People always say it's a city within a city, yeah. right? It's larger. The, the population of NYCHA, depending on how you kind of, you know, sort of, there's a lot of unofficial people living in NYCHA projects. We know this. So it could be half a million people. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, that's, that's larger than a lot of American cities, all right? And yet it's run by essentially a relatively small number of people at this point. Um, and, you know, they have responsibility for an aging uh, basically underfunded and also hard used system. Yeah. We're going to take a short break, then we'll be back with Nicholas Dagan Bloom after this message. <music> Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy, and I'm talking with Nicholas Dagan Bloom professor of social science at New York Institute of Technology. Uh, while New Yorkers have, you know, been b bombarded with all of these stories about how hellish conditions are right. in at least some of the sure. housing projects, um, you have written, and you mentioned before, that there have been some major refitting mm -hmm. activities going on. Could you tell me about some of them? So <clears throat> the way it works and why I don't think it shows uh, in the sort of the news reporting is I, I know from discussions with people in the Capitol Division going back a long time that they made a decision years ago to basically preserve the buildings first uh, because they had limited money. So it would be roofs and, and brick repair and basically focusing on those issues and for instance not apartments. So what we know for sure is that billions of dollars have been spent in New York unlike in other cities to basically try to basically preserve the housing stock as a whole. Um, and so a lot of these are not repairs and things like that that immediately um, well, I mean, people who are living under a leaking roof, that's obviously a big improvement. Uh, but, you know, they are about saving the housing for another generation. Um, yet, many people will not experience within their own apartment, for instance, the kinds of upgrades they want. Um, one controversial proposal has been to let private developers sure. build market rate or mixed income housing on NYCHA property as a way of raising money for NYCHA. So, I mean, what comes to mind is uh, a housing project with a parking lot, mm -hmm. and suddenly there's a, a luxury building or a mixed, you know, income building right there next to the project. Is this happening? 
It's been happening for a long time. Has it really? But affordable. Almost all of the new infill projects have been um, skewed towards affordable housing. So maybe not um, a certain proportion of the apartments, maybe at rental rates, which NYCHA residents could afford, but most of them above. But okay. still at the kind of, you know, um, working, sort of the working people of New York um, uh, level. So yes, the infill has gone forward. Uh, the issue is, though, that um, when you, because they're building affordable housing, uh, mostly affordable housing on these sites, they don't generate the kind of revenue that would really renovate the buildings yeah. around them. And so some of the early proposals by a former chair, for instance, were to build market rate. And I know that the mayor is talking about coming towards you know, more market rate buildings to generate money. Um, but that tends to be very controversial, right, yeah. to put that. And it creates a weird condition, right, uh, between basically people of very high income and uh, people of a basically an income. average of about 23,000. Yeah. yeah. Um, you write about privatiz privatization mm -hmm in general as the wave of the future for yeah. public housing. Um, not talking about what we were just talking about, but um, you mentioned that former NYCHA chair Shola Olatoye has pushed for movement in that direction. Tell me about how well, that works. So here's how it works. Because of the changing federal landscape, um, there is no secure funding for public housing year to year. Uh, where there is secure funding for subsidized housing in the United States are in public-private partnerships. So when I say that, I mean it can be whether through the low-income housing tax credit program, but also through Section 8. Section 8, actually NYCHA runs a very large and pretty successful Section 8 program in the city. Um, but that is basically a partnership between NYCHA and private developers and owners, uh, really private owners at this point. Um, and so what happens is that the, the federal government has basically made it very clear that uh, wherever possible, public housing authorities should look to um, partner with private uh, managers for renovation and operations in some cases uh, to basically kind of transition public housing from something that is entirely government run and funded uh, to one that is kind of a hybrid. Now I know how Section 8 yeah. <clears throat> operates with uh, private buildings, I mean, you get this, if <clears throat> you get this voucher, it's a voucher, called yeah. a voucher, right? And if you can get a landlord who will accept it, sure. uh, then, you know, the federal government will pay mm -hmm. your rent or a portion of your rent. Right. How would that work in, ter in terms of, uh, we're talking about Section 8 in yes. housing projects? It's how would already that been work? done in a number of ways, but the, basically what happens is it happened in the Rockaways, it's happened in other projects is that essentially the NYCHA project is renovated uh, by a private operator or developer, and then a private management company runs it, and the tenants basically, instead of basically receiving a public housing subsidy, they receive a Section 8 voucher. Okay. Uh, and so that basically the private, that's what, you know, if you think about, well, what's in it for a private manager to take over a NYCHA project? Who would want that? Well you know, there is something there. We have these developments which are essentially structurally sound, right? They need renovation. So the private manager basically borrows money uh, to, or gets grants also from city, state, federal, right? To renovate these projects. Uh, and then they collect that section eight uh, voucher plus the rent that the tenant pays. So it's pretty great. I mean, to develop new buildings in New York is very expensive and difficult. So to be kind of given, right, a uh, building with no underlying mortgage, right, you go out, you borrow money, renovate it, and then you get a guaranteed stream of income through Section 8. And Section 8 is much more politically popular nationally, again, because it's not purely public. And you say it has happened, it's Already. been happening? Yeah, and there's plans, massive plans to increase the scale of this program. Um, former chair, NYCHA chair, Shola Olatoye was, I guess, sort of run out because of, you know, all of this bad publicity. Uh, you think she did some positive things? Well, she certainly did, and she tried, <coughs> certainly in other areas. So, certainly, um, before she came along, there had been none of this uh, public-private partnership uh, in this way. So she pushed that and moved very quickly to basically do these demonstration projects, some demonstration projects that showed that through this partnership uh, you could achieve nicely renovated buildings, new security at a much more economical rate. And then that basically helped sell this idea to tenants and their advocates. Things that didn't work out, which she, tr she tried, she tried for instance to extend the hours 
and the work rules for NYCHA. The unionized the, members. NYCHA, right, and that failed. In, in essence, they did some uh, pilot programs, but essentially the courts turned that back. Uh, and so, you know, again, that's, you, you can get these demonstration projects done, really high profile for a few, you know, thousand people, right? But systemically, I think what she faced was too heavy. Uh, to basically, you know, she doesn't, what people don't realize is that the authority essentially doesn't negotiate its own co labor contracts, right? And so um, they, she doesn't have, she didn't have that power to basically change and kind of respond to what tenants were saying. We want people in these buildings after four or five o'clock, right? You know, doing cleaning and, and more like the private sector, right? right? Something needs to be done. So she, she was unable to really systemically sort of change that. And, you know, that's still the case today. Can that be changed? Sure, it could be changed, but it is uh, politically very difficult. Uh, and I think <coughs> that, you know, I, I think there are arguments on the other side why, you know, for instance, a lot of um, employees don't feel safe at night, for instance, in a NYCHA development. That was the main piece, was that they felt uncomfortable. Uh, but in the end, I think NYCHA, the NYCHA union leadership and so forth is going to have to face the fact that they're either going to have to change to a new kind of labor regime which has basically happened with these private conversions, where almost all of the, very few of the NYCHA staff stayed, right? They, they basically were given an opportunity to go over into the private sector, and they decided not to because the benefits aren't as good, mm -hmm. the rules aren't the same. Um, but if they allow, if NYCHA basically scales, is able to scale up these conversions, which is known as RAD, right, then um, this will probably significantly cut into employment uh, in uh, public housing unions. So they, they probably need to adjust in some way. Why should we care about preserving these, keeping these 325 public housing projects? What's the value of them to New York City? Well, you know, people talk a lot today about the importance of permanent affordable housing. And, you know, there's this weird thing where, like, uh, sort of schizophrenia, where affordable housing and public housing are seen as these, you know, completely different and unconnected. Uh, sort of programs, but in fact they're deeply connected. We now um, believe that public housing should be an important stepping stone, for instance, from homelessness. Uh, and so a lot of people, there is a basically a homeless preference in public housing. So it's that step to permanent long-term housing. There's a reason why there's still hundreds of thousands of people on public housing waiting lists. Is there a homeless preference now? There, there wasn't is. for a while, there right? There wasn't for a while, but there is. Okay. So um, there's also working family preference to help people as well. Um, so public housing serves as a very important kind of uh, place for people moving, you know, into long-term stable housing. That's key. Also, in the city, what's the most endangered species? It's the apartment uh, that costs less than $900 a month. And we know from uh, controller Stringer, right, <laughs> that actually, I think he said in the end, in the, the report was maybe 400,000 were lost in the last few years. Um, so we're talking about um, a system where the average rent is $550 a month for 178,000 apartments. Um, they're not, we're not making a lot more of these. Even in the new affordable housing programs, there are very few apartments that rent at that rate. So this is a, like a crucial sort of moment where the city's going to have to decide if in neighborhoods like Chelsea or the Lower East Side there are going to be any poor people living or any poorer people or any, even any working class people living in these neighborhoods because that's the only, it's one of the only places where you have basically this reservoir of, of really low cost apartments. 400, 500,000 residents of housing project. Do they have any political power well, they to make any of this happen? They do, actually. And, and what I have noticed, for instance, in Queensbridge houses, uh, they used their basically uh, city and state representatives very effectively to get um, a, a massive roof repair done um, and other um, kind of improvements. And so what I've seen is where uh, you have really effective uh, tenant leaders, usually women, uh, they are able to use uh, the local political leadership uh, to basically get um, funding. And I think if you look kind of overall, what we see is the wheel is starting to shift, right? You can talk about politics in many ways, but embarrassment is also a form of politics. And I think they're doing a very good job, you know, for embarrassing. of embarrassing, yeah. you know, whether it's the mayor or public officials. And I think that's crucial at this point. They'll need a plan, too, of what they want. 
You know, they're going to have to say, you know, we need this kind of, you know, 10% of that 30 billion per year, you know, 3 billion a year to get to a certain place. They will have to formulate at some point what their goals are. But, um, you know, for a very long time, NYCHA residents didn't have to be political in a sense. I mean, they were, some of them were. Uh, they understood how much more they could get by being political. But because the system was relatively well run and funded, things happened, right? It was like, okay, new refrigerators are coming in, right? Or new elevators, right? Things were happening. Um, and now they realize that that kind of guaranteed um, sort of funding is no longer. So like, they've got to do stuff to make stuff And they happen. are, they are. Yeah. I'm afraid we're out of time. I want to thank Nicholas Dagenblum for joining me today. His books, Public Housing That Worked, New York in the 20th Century, and Affordable Housing in New York, The People, Places, and Policies That Transformed a City, are available online and in stores now. For One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.